Hello, this module is entitled Monitoring Disability Inclusive Development and Other CRPD Obligations. It is part of the online learning series brought to you by the U.S. International Council on Disabilities with the generous support of Rehabilitation International. Like other modules in this learning series, there are specific learning objectives and topics to be covered. We seek in this module to answer the following key questions. What is monitoring and how does it relate to Article 32 of the CRPD? What is the obligation to report? What is the CRPD reporting cycle? And very importantly, what are the responsibilities and roles of organizations of persons with disabilities in this monitoring process? This slide asks a key question for this module. What is monitoring? Well, monitoring a human rights convention or treaty refers to checking or tracking to see whether a state party to the treaty is actually meeting its obligations. In other words, is the state complying or not? If not, why not? What can it do better? What steps can it take to improve? Monitoring Article 32 of this treaty, the CRPD, might entail looking at whether a country is ensuring that its development programs are inclusive of persons with disabilities. For a donor nation, for example, are their programs implemented in other countries accessible? Or for recipients of development assistance, is the country ensuring that its development programs, those programs being implemented in its country, are accessible to persons with disabilities? So that's how we can think about questions relating to monitoring or checking to see whether a particular state is actually meeting its Article 32 obligations. Let's now turn to the consideration of who exactly monitors human rights treaties. Take a minute to think about the key actors who might be involved in monitoring implementation of the CRPD, especially in relation to Article 32 obligations. Who do you think the key actors might be? Who is involved in monitoring? Are there actors other than states? If so, who? Well, there's many stakeholders who monitor human rights conventions. Of course, these include states' parties to the treaty, but also particularly in the case of the CRPD, we're talking about organizations of persons with disabilities, as well as other civil society organizations that take on monitoring of human rights treaties. Think, for example, about Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or any number of other organizations focused on monitoring a state's implementation of its human rights obligations. There are other independent actors who take on monitoring. For example, national human rights commissions or ombudspersons. These entities are independent of government and often play a very important role in monitoring human rights conventions and how states are actually complying with them or otherwise. UN mechanisms, of course, including the treaty bodies, have a very important role to play in monitoring. Beyond the treaty bodies, we could think of UN Special Rapporteurs and independent experts, like the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or the Independent Expert on Persons with Albinism. These United Nations Special Procedures play very important roles in monitoring. And we can probably identify many other actors engaged in monitoring as well. So under Article 35 of the CRPD, states, parties must participate in the filing of reports to the CRPD committee. 
The reporting duty starts within two years of a state party's ratification, and then it follows a four-year reporting cycle. Submitting these reports to the CRPD committee on how they're doing with implementation. Now, remember that the European Union is a ratifying state's party or party to the CRPD. It's a regional integration organization, but like a state party, it has to follow monitoring obligations and reporting obligations to the CRPD committee. This is, of course, incredibly important given that the EU is one of the largest donors for international cooperation programs. What are the roles for organizations of persons with disabilities in monitoring and in reporting? Well, first of all, our starting point ought to be Article 4.3 of the CRPD. It sets out the far-reaching obligation among states to consult closely with persons with disabilities, including children with disabilities, through representative organizations. And here in particular, we are talking about organizations of persons with disabilities, those organizations who are led by and composed of individuals with disabilities. Of course, under Article 33 of the CRPD, that's the article concerning national level monitoring, organizations of persons with disabilities and civil society organizations generally have a role to play in the monitoring process. That means that states must give these organizations a role in monitoring implementation of the convention. This next slide provides a brief summary of the CRPD monitoring and implementation measures at the international level. So these include three different elements of the CRPD's international monitoring mechanisms. First on the slide is the Conference of States Parties. This is the uh, body that meets in order to consider any matter with regard to implementation of the convention. Typically, this conference has been meeting annually in New York, and it's an opportunity for both states' parties and civil society actors, as well as national human rights institutions, to come together and to consider matters of implementation. The Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, of course, is the treaty monitoring body established by the CRPD itself. It's a body of independent experts serving in their individual or personal capacity. They're not representing any state. That body is tasked with reviewing state's implementation of the convention. At the outset, it was composed of 12 independent experts, but given the many, many numbers of ratification of this treaty, uh, it has now reached its full complement of 18 members. Now, the optional protocol to the CRPD, so we can think of that as a, uh, a treaty that is linked to the parent treaty. Under that separate treaty, that optional protocol, some additional monitoring roles are conferred on the CRPD committee, and states can decide to opt in to that extra treaty or not. For those states who do decide to ratify the optional protocol, it grants the CRPD committee a couple of additional mandates. One is the review of individual or group communications alleging violations of the CRPD and resulting in non-binding but still important recommendations to a state. And secondly, it confers on the CRPD committee a procedure of inquiry, allowing the CRPD committee to review grave and systemic violations of the CRPD in a particular country. And again, that results in non-binding, but nonetheless very important findings. Monitoring and implementation occurs, of course, most importantly, at the national level. And the CRPD has 
essentially three key roles in relation to monitoring and implementation obligations at the national level under Article 33 of the CRPD. First, governments that have ratified the treaty are to designate or establish a national focal point, a focal point that oversees implementation of the treaty obligations. And states are encouraged to establish a coordination mechanism within government. That's very important because disability is a cross-cutting issue. So in the context of international development, you might imagine that a Ministry of Planning and Development might be a very important body to sit on a coordination committee, for example. Second, National human rights institutions, or NHRIs, play their own independent monitoring role under the CRPD. And Article 33.2 calls for the designation or establishment of such a body to play that very important independent monitoring role, independent of government. And then finally, civil society is also conferred its own monitoring role under Article 33.3, as we've talked about. The CRPD committee members, as indicated, includes 18 members in their individual capacity. And the photo on the slide here shows two of those, the current, as of 2021, chair and vice chair of the CRPD committee, Rosemary Case from Australia, and Minyon Kim from South Korea. The committee is comprised of individual experts, most of whom have lived experience with disabilities. And secondly, uh, the committee was the very first UN treaty body ever to include an expert with an intellectual disability. This treaty continues to break down barriers in every way, shape, and form, including in its monitoring role. So let's look a little more carefully at the monitoring and reporting requirements. Article 35 of the CRPD requires that states report to the CRPD committee. The committee receives their report and starts its review. But let's look at that a little more closely to see the step-by-step -step process in reporting. First, what do states report on to the CRPD committee? Well, under Article 4, they are supposed to make sure their legal framework is consistent with the CRPD, and that might require a range of law reform and policy budgeting measures, among others. And it also requires that non-discrimination and equality, among many other aspects, should be reflected in the domestic legal framework. So a state needs to uh, specifically report on its general obligations and what it's done, for example, in enacting or amending legislation and policies, in addition to reporting on its very specific obligations under the CRPD. For example, the specific obligations set out in Articles 10 through 30, ranging from the right to life under Article 10, all the way to the right to participate in sport and culture under Article 30. There's other obligations, however. These include the requirement to collect data and st statistics disaggregated on the basis of disability. That obligation is in Article 31 of the treaty. Of course, we know that there are also obligations in relation to international cooperation, Article 32, in addition to the monitoring obligations. The CRPD committee, for example, will very often ask states to what extent civil society organizations and OPDs in particular have participated in monitoring. How are OPDs supported in the reporting process? Well, they're often supported in their engagement with the CRPD reporting process 
through programs of international cooperation. Donors often support this work, whether uh, the U.S. Agency for International Development or the Council of Europe, the OSCE, the European Union, the United Kingdom, many other donors who are supporting organizations of persons with disabilities will very often have processes that help OPDs engage in the reporting process. The International Disability Alliance, or IDA, has an office in Geneva that is available to help and can participate in the interactive dialogue, particularly if local OPDs are unable to attend the session in Geneva when the state party has its dialogue with the CRPD committee. So let's look at the reporting cycle step by step. It starts with the state report and then proceeds to the issuance of a list of issues by the CRPD committee or additional questions for consideration of the state. The state has the chance to respond to that list of issues. After that, the state and the CRPD committee participate in a constructive dialogue in Geneva. After that, the CRPD committee issues its concluding observations and recommendations to the state. So step one, the reporting cycle begins and the report ought to be prepared within two years after ratification and then, as we've said, in four-year cycles thereafter. Early on, the state party ought to be having consultations with civil society, including, of course, especially organizations of persons with disabilities. In step two, the state party submits its report to the CRPD committee, and this is then an opportunity for input from throughout the UN system, from national human rights institutions, from OPDs and NGOs. They, that they have the opportunity at that point to start reviewing the state report and to consider whether or not the state has accurately reported or comprehensively reported on the actual situation. At that point, organizations of persons with dis disabilities working in coalition have the opportunity to submit to prepare first and then submit their own parallel or shadow reports to the CRPD committee with priority issues and concrete recommendations. Under step three, the list of issues is uh, presented to the state party with questions based on concerns or additional information needed as a result of the CRPD committee's initial review of the state report. OPDs can suggest certain issues uh, and can therefore contribute in that process of the CRPD committee formulating lists of issues. Under step four, a state party submits written replies in response to the list of issues and questions presented to it, and OPDs may also give their own responses to list of issues. This can really help the committee in its questioning of the state during that interactive dialogue component. Under step five, the interactive dialogue actually takes place between the state and the CRPD committee sitting in Geneva. This slide shows a picture of one of those such committees. This is an opportunity, again, for input from the UN system and NHRIs and OPDs and other NGOs. Sometimes NGOs have their own uh, side session with the committee members and the country rapporteur on the committee. The, the person is sort of the designated focal point for that particular state party's reporting process. And OPDs can request to give an oral presentation during the session in which the constructive dialogue with their country can take place. So the interactive dialogue is a very important opportunity for civil society as well as the state. Under step six, 
the CRPD committee issues its concluding observations on the report and its recommendations. Before concluding observations are adopted, OPDs can identify priority issues that it hopes to see reflected in the committee's concluding observations and recommendations. The concluding observations and recommendations ought to be circulated widely at the national level, both by the government as well as civil society organizations and others. And step seven contains uh, a process for follow-up, follow-up procedures on implementation of those recommendations made by the CRPD committee. Here too is another opportunity for other actors to weigh in. OPDs should be working with the national monitoring mechanism, the independent one, and the government on implementing recommendations and follow-up. And OPDs should do their own monitoring for the next report to follow. Now this slide contains some ideas about advocacy planning for OPDs so that they can engage effectively in the CRPD reporting process. So formation of a coalition and a reporting team would be a critical first step. The CRPD committee has issued guidelines for civil society on how to be effective in putting together a shadow report. And one of the first things they talk about is the importance of forming a coalition. The CRPD committee does not have a huge amount of time to read dozens of different reports from different civil society groups. Speaking in one voice is therefore incredibly effective and very important. At, then after a coalition is formed, a reporting team, a reporting advocacy plan and timeline ought to be created. Different tasks need to be allocated for different parts of the coalition and reporting team. Research and information gathering that's credible and reliable needs to take place. And the report needs to be, be developed based on that evidence base that's been created during that research and information gathering process. Consultations need to happen with stakeholders and different partners and of course OPDs before any report is finalized. And the report, of course, needs to be submitted to the CRPD committee itself, as well as other stakeholders. Advocacy needs to support the concluding observations and recommendations of the CRPD committee. Advocacy that draws upon the shadow report created by a coalition of OPDs. And of course, there needs to be national level follow-up. A shadow report should never be created in a vacuum and then put up on a shelf. There needs to be check-ins with government about implementation. And then there needs to be continued dissemination of findings to other actors, like the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities or to human rights organizations or national human rights commissions. So advocacy planning is really critical to be effective in engaging with the reporting process. And this goes for any aspect, whether it's uh, advocacy around Article 32 implementation or any other aspect of the treaty. This slide gives a couple of ideas about the format and structuring of a shadow report. There's more detailed guidance in the CRPD committee guidelines on the participation of disabled persons organizations and civil society in the work of the committee that was published in 2014. They talks about the length of the document, gives a limit as well. It talks a little bit about the structure and the format as well, identifying, you know, who is the submitting organization and coalition, describing some of its activities and mission and vision statement role of persons with disabilities in the organization and so forth. And it talks a little bit about the format of a report. So a coalition and reporting team ought to give very careful consideration to those guidelines prior to commencing their work. This last slide lists 
a few resources that you might find helpful if you want to learn a little bit more about reporting processes and reporting to the CRPD committee. Thanks for listening.